Hi class. Welcome to Research Methods. We're doing our highlights for Chapter 2, which is about an overview of the scientific method. Um, basically looking at this cyclical um, process that we use for doing research in psychological science uh, using the scientific method. The highlights that we're looking at today are that model and running through the seven steps of conducting research. Um, and you're going to see how um, it's kind of like a setup where this is the information that we will be looking at for the rest of the term across our different chapters in the textbook. So consider this just an overview of the process and we're going to go into more detail as we get into the corresponding chapters. So again, the cyclical model always starts with the research question and developing that question that can be uh, turned into an empirical study so that we have a testable hypothesis and can collect the data from a representative sample, analyze the data, come to conclusions so that then we can circle around again and see where the next questions that come up from the first study then take us next. So it's, a, it's an ongoing thing here. The development of a theory and a test, it goes through reiterations each time. And that's that cyclical model that they're talking about there. But looking at these steps, they start with finding a research topic. And there are a lot of opportunities to generate uh, research questions and topics through observations of just behaviors and actions that surround us every day to looking for how to address a particular uh, problem that we're working with or to working with questions that have come up from prior research. And uh, these tips for finding research topics tend to lean more into applied research instead of the basic research that they talked about in chapter one. But you could use uh, these same um, tips for generating a research topic to look at basic research as well. I find that the more challenging part is finding a research topic to narrow down to a testable feasible portion of it. Like we often come up with ideas that are just too big to be able to test. And then here in the picture, I have Dr. Cass with his lab that was looking at distracted driving with a driving simulator. In fact, if you want to see more of his lab, I put a link in the um, canvas area where you can see other things he does in his lab. The second step that they talk about in your chapter is reviewing and searching for uh, research literature and looking at these primary research literature sources. So like peer-reviewed journals that do empirical research or literature reviews or theoretical articles, or also scholarly books if they are in like psychology or related fields. So not really like a self-help book or just a, a popular press book or magazine. It would be something that has undergone the peer review process. And it's quite a process where like when I have a, um, a research that I've completed writing, I would submit it to a journal, but I have to take my name off of everything so that it's blind. The reviewers don't know who wrote it. And then I don't get to know who the reviewers are either. So they're, I'm blind to who is looking at the paper, right? And so my paper would go first to the editor and the editor would decide if it's going to go out to the reviewers. And they would send it to two or three uh, peer reviewers, someone else who knows about the same um, concepts and the same types of analyses that I'm using and they would look it over and see if it's up to standard, up to what the journal, uh, journal's aims and scope and focus is. And they would, the reviewers would look at it, 
write up a little evaluation and send that back to the editor. And then the editor would decide if my paper needed revisions or if they were not just not going to accept it. So it, the decision ends up being either rejected or revise and resubmit. They never just accept it. So it's quite a process. Uh, it can take like a whole year to run through that process and all its steps for peer review to look over other people's work. And then they also mention in this chapter about the literature search and how um, they point out the um, PsychInfo search engine, which we'll be using when we do our PsychInfo exercise. But there's also other search engines like ResearchGate, Google Scholar, and our library uses EBSCOhost uh, as a database as well for us to be able to have access to literature. And there's a lot of interesting uh, conversation on the web about open access research so that you're not dependent on having a library that has access to databases for you to be able to read what the research is. So that's a pretty cool development going on as well. The next step they talk about is this development of the research question. Because even though we have an idea, we need to bring it down to a small enough size that it's empirically testable, that we can observe the behaviors or somehow collect the information about the question that we're asking. So for something to be empirically testable, we start by reading the literature and looking for questions posed at the end of the discussion. Like when a research has been published, that discussion section at the end usually has something in it about future directions or continued questions that they have about what um, effect and what relationship, what phenomenon they were looking at. And that's a good place to get a good research question to jump off of. But we can also look at research questions in those areas that were goals for science, like looking to describe, uh, describing how frequently does a behavior or a phenomena happen, or how intense does this behavior seem to happen, how frequent. We could also look to predict. In other words, is the targeted behavior associated with some other variable, like maybe it's associated by gender, that it's more frequent for women than for men, or maybe it's associated with industry, that it's more frequent for high stress industries or job roles than for other job roles. We could also look at making a research question that will explain a behavior and look for the possible causes of the behavior or the occurrence. And then after we have the research question, we need to evaluate how interesting and feasible is it? And when they talk about interesting, they're talking about does the answer to this research question actually impact anyone else? Like, is it important to everyone, not just the researcher? Or is it a behavior that has a high prevalence? Like you could say um, um, anorexia coupled with substance abuse. Is that something that happens prevailing a lot, that it would be important for us to find out more about that, that connection, things like that. Another way we can determine if something is within the interesting and feasible area, does answering this research question fill a gap of understanding in the literature? So that would be back to that discussion section at the end of an article. If they found gaps, and they couldn't quite explain what was going on when they did their study, that would represent an area where we could have a research question to help fill in that missing information. Feasibility looks at things like, do we have the time to run that kind of study, the skills, the equipment, and the access to participants that would be a good representative sample for this study. And then another one that we probably won't get into until chapter three, is it ethical to conduct this study? 
There are some studies that we cannot ethically do, uh, as we will see more in the ethical practices chapter. Our next step uh, talks about developing the hypothesis. And here it's good, I picked up some of these definitions between the differences between theories and hypotheses to kind of help explain the differences between them. In our book, we have that a theory is explained as a coherent explanation or interpretation of one or more phenomena. And a hypothesis is a specific prediction about a new phenomenon that should be observed if the theory is accurate. So these two areas uh, show us that the theory is kind of like the overall explanation and our attempt to explain behavior, whereas a hypothesis is trying to test if that theory is accurate. These other um, definitions for theories and hypotheses that I picked up also help see the whole picture. When hypotheses have been uh, consistent and replicated and seem to be all confirming the theory, then that theory is considered more true and more um, not sustainable, but more valid, more able to be trusting in that theory. Whereas a hypothesis is an educated guess based on observations if it's not already based in theory. Here, a theory explains a set of related observations or confirmed events and a verified multiple times by separate groups of researchers, so that replication. Whereas hypothesis is a rational explanation of a single event, it hasn't been replicated yet, or can be supported or refuted by continued experimentation or observation. So if we do replication studies and we find that sometimes the hypothesis is confirmed and sometimes it isn't, then there's something else going on there. And it's not maybe the best hypothesis to test the theory or the theory needs to be updated and modified. And again, that's that, that cyclical nature of development of theory where we take the observation, develop the theory, test the theory, refine the theory. Evaluating a hypothesis comes down to, is it testable? Can it be falsified? And those are, we, that's why we look at empirical questions, looking at what is not just a, a philosophical construct, like is there a God, is not something that we're going to test with a hypothesis. That's more of a belief or philosophical statement. Uh, a hypothesis needs to be logical, as in informed by the prior literature on what the expectation is. And a hypothesis needs to make a positive statement of the effect that would be found if it's true, if we should confirm it. Um, so we don't hypothesize that something will not be there, like there will be the absence of light or the absence of a behavior. Uh, because that leads to many issues statistically and practically. Because if an occurrence didn't happen, how would we know what caused the not happening? So it's always a statement about what we will see, not what we won't see. But this does bring up a couple of different things. You notice how sometimes we're starting with observations and generating theory and sometimes we're starting with theory and then coming to confirming if that theory is um, solid or not based on the hypothesis. And this is two different ways of doing research. One is called the deductive. Um, research conducted deductively is to generate theory. The, then the, uh, the researcher would start by looking at things going on around them watching for patterns, developing a tentative hypothesis, and generating a theory, and then they would need to test that several times to see if the hypothesis needs to be modified or the theory needs to be modified. That's the deductive 
flow or approach to research. Typically, we use the inductive approach. We start with an established theory that is already there. We develop a hypothesis to test it, and then we do our observation or data collection to test the hypothesis, and we either confirm or refute the hypothesis and then go back up to testing the theory with a new hypothesis. The next step that we talk about in the chapter or overview in the chapter are these study designs. Designing the study itself, there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, in fact, we're going to see more of these topics in chapters four, five, and six. So again, chapter two is just an overview of the scientific method, and we'll go into more detail on these things as we move along in the chapter. So the difference between an experimental and non-experimental uh, study, the experimental manipulates the independent variable. It controls for extraneous variables and possible alternative explanations. It's the type of analysis or design that has to be used if we're trying to identify a causal relationship. And you need to, it needs to be run several times replicated from different researchers so that it can be um, tried and true. Whereas a non-experimental does not necessarily have a manipulated IV. Uh, the participants are not necessarily randomly selected or assigned, and often it'll use more naturalistic observations like just in the workplace or in the park or wherever people are instead of being in a lab setting. The non-experimental design is not suitable for identifying causal relationships, so it only looks at correlational or descriptive types of analyses. And usually the non-experimental can be supported or refuted after several uh, replications of experimentation or observation. Some of the other areas that go into study design include defining what is the topic, what is the phenomena and the variables or the behaviors and constructs going into what's being inspected there. And then operationalizing those constructs so that we know how we're going to measure them. In measurement, we're going to be talking about how reliable or consistent the measurement is and how valid or accurate the measurement is. We'll go into types of variables like the continuous or categorical variables and what that means as far as what we are reporting about those variables. We'll also talk about sample recruitment. That's going to be more in our survey uh, chapter, which I think is chapter seven and also talk about the differences between field and lab studies. The next step that chapter two or tells us a little bit about is the data analysis. And you can see those falling into two main camps, the descriptive statistics and the inferential statistics. And those we're going to talk more about in chapters 12 and 13. But along the way, we will also discuss uh, measures of central tendency, measures of variability, type one and type two errors, where the probability of making an error in our conclusion, what does that look like? So I did give us a um, website to check out for the seven most common data analysis mistakes to avoid. Um, but it's just, I'll leave it in the canvas area so you can check it out. And the final step that we get introduced to is reporting results. Uh, whenever we work with our studies and we find out an answer to our research question, we need to get that out into the research community. And that can be done in different ways. 
we have presentations that can be done, like at the Student Scholar Symposium. We have conferences, like professional conferences for whatever profession, like licensed mental health workers, um, group researchers, um, management researchers, all of these different types of research areas m have their own conferences and journals and books that we can report our results towards. So going back to this idea of the cyclical nature of a research process and how it starts with the research question, you develop the study and collect the data, do the data analysis, come up with conclusions, and then goes back to uh, the research literature by publication and looking at what else might be a gap in the literature there. So this is the process that we were introduced to in the chapter, but you can see it in different forms as well. Like this uh, four step one that I use in my lab is a framework that I use to help describe the research process to students who get involved in my lab. And I'll walk you through it real quick just for, you'll see that it pretty much matches the same thing and you will see different ways of describing the research process in different books or websites that you check out. So for my lab, I tell students that it starts with the design. Coming up with that research question, it defines the purpose of the study. And then we review the prior work, prior findings, prior methods, any gaps or limitations in the prior work, and this helps to develop the hypothesis. The hypothesis serves as the basis for the design of the study, including um, if it's going to be experimental or non-experimental, or where it should be conducted and what kinds of data should be collected, who should be the sample, and what statistical techniques to use. The hypothesis guides all of those once it's determined. That's why researchers have to develop a very strong, solid, testable, empirical hypothesis because everything else hinges after that. Then conducting the study. So again, what design is being used? What type of sampling? Is it going to be a random select and assignment? Is it going to be lab or in field? And looking at that measurement quality, is it consistent, like reliable? Is it accurate, as in valid? Then analyzing the data. After it's collected, the statistical techniques are to describe the sample and the differences and relationships going on in the sample, or to make inferential st statistical uh, claims where we are claiming that there's a predictive relationship or a more complicated relationship called a moderated or mediated relationship, or if we're testing for causal relationships. And then the goal to report uh, our hypothesis findings, to answer the research question, and to provide more understanding about that phenomena or that area of interest back to the research community. So it's quite a build. The research question informs the hypothesis. The hypothesis informs everything else. And then when you're conducting and analyzing all of those work together, they affect each other. And that informs the statistical techniques that we're using and brings us to the goal of reporting. And after it's all reported, you have more questions and you go back up to the top. So it can be a hot mess. It can be very busy. Um, that's why research takes a long time is because there's a lot going on there. But that chapter two, again, was just to give an overview of the research process and how it's cyclical in nature and has a lot of moving parts.
And like I said, we will go into more of these in detail in our future chapters. I did want to take a minute and kind of talk about our data project. So how does all this information relate to our research methods instructor? Well, he has a lot to do with these tasks that we just discussed to answer his research question of how do students perceive research method skills as relevant to their future work and lives. So we're going to be helping Professor Bob with the literature, with uh, article summaries about relevant literature that helps inform what he should do with his research question, all the way through uh, collecting the data, doing analysis, and doing the final write-up. Phew, so that's your overview for now. Um, just a couple of deliverables for chapter two before we start really cranking in here. You need to do your chapter Q&A discussion board and your chapter quiz. And have a great week.